Hello and welcome to my first video for the New Market Chamber Orchestra during lockdown. The first of a number of videos to come that will particularly focus on Beethoven's first symphony and a general musical approach for the orchestra that we're aiming for. Um, usually I go off script, but today I've written out what I want to say so that I don't miss anything important. In this first video, I'm going to be giving an overview of how I want to approach our performance of Beethoven's First Symphony by talking about the overarching style and interpretation I'm after and some of my reasoning behind my choices. Later videos will look at certain movements, indeed certain parts of movements in more detail, to really help pin down the musical style we're after and hopefully helpful ways of practicing to achieve this. You have already seen the excellent videos provided by our, by our leader, Paul, and I think there's something for everyone in those two, not just the string players. So, first of all, we're after an approach that will present this symphony in a way that Beethoven would hopefully have been happy with. Um, in other repertoire that we've done with the orchestra before, such as the symphonies by Haydn and Ariaga, we've really put on a performance that has a, a really good stylistic understanding from the tempos, phrasing, articulation, and, and so on. With the Beethoven, we're going for the same idea a modern day approach by performing on modern instruments, but with a strong underpinning of a historical practice that will give us a performance that is full of authentic flavor. 1800 was when this symphony was first given its premiere in Vienna, alongside one of his piano concertos and extracts of Haydn's The Creation. And the inclusion of Haydn to me highlights how much this first symphony is almost a homage to the work of Haydn and Mozart too, um, the work they've done with an eye to the future in what Beethoven give us. The orchestration is the same as the late Haydn symphony, but not as radical as he would become um, with trombones, contrabassoons, piccolos, um, and future symphonies by Beethoven. So immediately we know that Haydn is a key figure, but with Beethoven adding his unique stamp and moving the music forward to a more romantic flavour. There's plenty of Haydn-like features. The standout one for me is the musical joke. Um, at, the, at the start of the final movement, um, played by the first violins. And whilst it has many features that separate it from earlier symphonies by others, um, it's not actually that radical um, compared to some of the London symphonies of Haydn or, or later Mozart ones. And I think Beethoven can sometimes be perceived as being a little bit gloomy at times, but really it's, it's such dramatic and, and wild music but also, um, as, as highlighted in this symphony, very beautiful, lots of, of beautiful moments in this, alongside all the exciting and racing stuff. I suppose you can think of it that when he wrote this symphony, he had a foot in each of two centuries. Um, he lays down um, his kind of plan. This is, this is what I can do with the symphony, and now I'm gonna take it and, and work with it and show you what, how, it, how it's gonna develop. Anyway. Uh, that's just a brief intro. Um, you can read more about um, the program notes and, and some analysis. We're going to post an interesting video on the analysis, which I think is a good breakdown of understanding how it fits together. Um, but here's a few key areas that we need to focus on in order to achieve our authentic approach. Let's start with tempo. The rise of the metronome. Beethoven seemed to really jump on board with this idea, um, and he seemed pretty certain that his markings should be at the forefront of performances, his tempo markings. Um, and he said in a letter, the metronome markings will be sent to you very soon. Do wait for them. In our century, such markings are certainly necessary. Moreover, I have received letters from Berlin informing me that the first performance of the Ninth Symphony met with enthusiastic applause which I ascribe largely to the metronome markings, um, which is pretty humble from, from Beethoven, of course. So it's important to note that um, with the first symphony being written in 1800, it wasn't until 1817 that Beethoven added the tempo markings that you'll have on your music. That, of course, means that his idea on tempos for those movements are pretty likely to have shifted a bit in that time, but I still think they're a really important starting point for where we need to be. We're appreciating Beethoven's methods and what he wants. Of course, I don't think we have to stick strictly to the exact marking that he's given, um, but they are used as important guides so that we're working within that plausible parameter. Um, and more details on the tempo markings that we'll be working towards will come in videos on each movement. But quick examples, um, particularly focusing on Beethoven's tempo marking. The second movement of the first symphony, you'll find recordings of this really drawing it out. And actually the tempo marking of Quake equals 120, um, that we make it just slightly under there, I think, 
um, will really give it the singing style, which is highlighted in the, in the, the tempo mark in the Andante Cantabile con moto. So um, fully agree with that tempo. Uh, with the third movement, it's not a minuet, it's just Beethoven conforming to the symphony style. So much dictated by, by Haydn and Mozart in earlier years, that's why he called it that. This is a Beethoven scherzo, so a sign of, of things to come. It's going to really zip um, forward. The final movement, I think we're going to be aiming for something around minimum equals 76 when we hit the racing stuff there. Um, more details to come. It's quite strange, um, I always think, that the invention of the metronome near the 1800s and before that, the speed of the music was dictated purely by wording, or particularly in the Baroque period, the mood or general character of the piece. And of course, each composer will have their own views on exactly what each tempo marking meant. Um, so hopefully that gives you an idea of where I'm coming from with my reasoning on the tempo and how I've made those decisions. Above all, the markings that Beethoven has given us, admittedly 17 years after the symphony was written, are absolutely key to how we approach it. Um, there's myths kicking about that Beethoven couldn't hear the metronome, uh, but he would have seen it moving if he couldn't. Uh, some of the tempo markings do come across pretty quick, uh, particularly in that final movement. But, you know, Beethoven was radical elsewhere, you know, um, from whatever, from music that had happened before. It's very dramatic, dynamic changes, harmonic shifts and so on. So his kind of, um, kind of radical tempo, so I, I don't really think um, require too much questioning. The articulation. Um, I think this will be covered as I add videos on each movement um, and sections of each movement, but just a quick outline, um, and this could get quite long and tedious, so I don't want to drag it out too much. Um, the dots and the dashes, the punct and the stricter, um, there's been a great discussion on the exact way of approaching the differences between the dashes and dots in Beethoven. Um, I think the most important thing to start is for, with us is that we've got, we're playing from a great edition, Baron Writer, top edition, which is fantastic. And the editor of this edition, um, I think, you know, perhaps gives us a really good quote that, that's very useful. He says, it is nowadays generally agreed that any distinction between the two, the dots and the dashes, is only identifiable so sporadically as to be impossible to reflect in a new edition with any degree of logic or consist consistency. But we do know that Beethoven documented, um, is documented as saying that the dashes and dots were meant to be played differently. Um, and then that kind of opens up a bit of a can of worms, which is why we'll treat um, some of the articulation um, very much in context. Um, Leopold Mozart, um, Mozart's dad, who wrote a treaty on the fundamentals of playing, said the following, a composer often writes notes which he wishes to be played, each with a strongly accented stroke and separated one from another. In such cases, he signifies the kind of bowing by means of a little stroke which he writes over or under the notes. Pretty clear then, um, what, what we may be aiming for. But it gets a bit more blurred when slightly later composers have slightly different views on things. But essentially what we're after for that is it's kind of a musical underlining, an exclamation mark, if you like. Um, and the way we interpret that depends a little on the context, which is why I say the articulation element will probably be talked about um, in each video if there's something really um, definite that needs discussing. Um, it could mean that it's more accented or a bit more detached even, but there's a key difference between a staccato dot and a dash. You know, one takes away duration, the other adds some kind of significance. So, as I say, we'll approach the articulation as we go, uh, depending on the context. Vibrato. Um, I've talked about this a little bit before, and again, a big part of interpretation. There have been such large gear shifts on this. Orchestras in the early 20th century um, took quite a lot of liberties. Everything got slower and slower, and with it, more thick vibrato laid on when actually this is far removed from what would have been expected, uh, particularly in the, in the early half of the 19th century and, and even up to Brahms and Mahler. But that's not, of course, to say that it wasn't starting to happen more in the 19th century. It was developing in certain setups. In Baroque times, if we go back to then, um, vibrato was described as an ornament. It was an expressive device used to inflect long notes or to underline especially passionate moments. 
Um, and into the 19th century too, there's this common misconception that the vibrato should be layered on, I feel. And Joseph Joachim, who was regarded as one of the most significant violinists of the 19th century, said that vibrato was a substitute for real feeling. Approaching it in this way it is authentic, um, and actually it will make it sound more beautiful and expressive. And I know Paul uh, has mentioned already in some of the string videos about this um, kind of use of vibrato and uh, or lack of. But adding a vibrato can perhaps mask the beauty, as I say, that we're after. And without it, will give us a more scope with the shape and colour, um, rather than that, that thick sound. And um, finally, from me, then some suggested recordings, um, some suggested listening that will help to highlight the kind of performance I'm looking to achieve. Um, you will all know of my admiration for, for Sir Roger Norrington, bit of a bit of an idol. But I think this recording, um, his recording, um, is, is a great. All recordings are a great place to go for something authentic, um, and also, you know, wanting to do something different, particularly on the on the vibrato front. Um, his live recordings of all the symphonies with the Stuttgart Orchestra, which he conducts, is a great place to start. And he's also done one on period instruments with the London Mozart players. So you can hear the difference in, in the pitch there as well, which is quite interesting. Lots of different colours that it brings out. Um, and there's ultimately loads of recordings of, of Beethoven symphonies. Just a couple of others that, to pick out. Um, Harnum Core is interesting, some of the earliest. Um, there's the Scottish Chamber Orchestra recording, which I really like with Sir Charles McCarris, which is worth checking out. But you will also have um, recordings that you know already that you will like. But I guess these are suggestions of, of ones to hear the kind of approach that we will hopefully be, be going for. Um, so hopefully this is a good starting point to get an overview of the approach we're, we're looking to take. Um, videos will follow in the weeks to come that focus on each movement so that we can really pin down that whole piece, um, how we want to, to do it, so that when we return together again and, and can rehearse together again, we can hit the ground running, um, ready to put on a, a great stylistic and informed performance. And remember, please do get in touch if you have any questions at all, any particular areas of the piece you would like to be looked at and so on, um, but expect some videos in, in the coming days and weeks um, that kind of really focus in on, on certain parts of, of the symphony um, to help um, with the learning and really looking forward to to exploring such wonderful music in a stylistic um, and informed way.